few things before we begin. First, there is no class on Wednesday, so don't come here two days from now. Class is simply canceled. Uh, the problem set, the fifth problem set, because we, because the, the fourth was due just now, uh, the fifth won't be due until next Wednesday. So you get a, 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 a extended, more extended period of time. Um, anything else that's, as, as I said in class before, you know, obviously, I hope you figure this out, the, the problem sets will be on, on Colab. A whole lot of people emailed me about that, like, where is it, where is it? Well, I said it in class in an email, it's in Colab, look, look. Anyhow, what can I do? <sighs> about the, the problem set, at least two of the questions, I've talked to a lot of people about them, and it's worth just taking a minute to talk about them. Uh, one of them it has less to do about rockets and balloons. Than, uh, one of them, is, however, has everything to do with balloons. The, the first question that I wanted to say two cents about was the one about if you're traveling in a, in a, in a, in a space, spacecraft, spaceship, and you want to turn, can you do it? And if so, how? Sure you can turn. You use your rocket exhaust to do this. You push on the rocket exhaust, and it pushes back on you and propels you in the direction uh, opposite the rocket exhaust. So, so if you're heading along, for example, toward the door, off your, you're, you're coasting along. Inertia is doing this for you. And you suddenly want to head, say, uh, toward you guys. I, if, if this is my rocket nozzle here, I have to rotate the ship so that my rocket nozzle can push back. And I begin to push. The question is, which direction do I push the rocket exhaust? So that's, that's how you, you turn generically. But if the goal is to end up starting from heading toward the door to end up heading toward you exactly, that's my, final, my initial velocity is that way. My final velocity is this rocket ship is exactly toward you. The direction in which I want to be pushed is a little complicated. I don't want, what, what will not work is for me to simply rotate my ship so that the, the rocket exhaust will push me exactly toward you and blast away. That won't do it. The reason that won't do it is because if I'm moving this way, I've got momentum toward your left. And until something gets rid of that momentum, I'm going to keep moving toward your left. And simply aiming toward you and blasting away won't get rid of my momentum toward the left. I'll keep coasting that way. Is that making some sense, I hope? You have to actually overcompensate. You have to aim not, you know, not directly toward you, but actually a little bit backwards so that the rock exhaust is two things. It pushes the ship part toward you, which is the, the, the ultimate goal, and a little bit backwards, opposite its current direction, so that it loses that momentum toward the door. In effect, the ship will then make a turn like a car on a road. When you, when you turn on a road, you're, you're heading this way, and you arc around like this to head this way, that turn is part of a circle, approximately. And in a circle, when you're going at steady speed in a circle, you're accelerating toward the center of the circle. It's not in, in the direction of your destination. It's not in the direction you came from. It's in between. And you go around the circle like that. So a spaceship trying to turn needs to be pushed kind of toward that center of the circle of that turn. Uh, it won't look great for movies. So spaceship dodged around and stuff like that, it's all wacky. It has very little to do with physics. The, the, to, to make the spaceship turn, yeah, what, what would it look like? It might be worth trying to animate what a real spaceship should be doing in order to make the turn. It will, it will be aimed completely, the, seemingly the wrong direction. It'll be going that way, but aimed this way because it's using its rocket exhaust. It's going to look w weird. Not what you expect, but it'll work on a physics basis rather than a, a movie theatrical basis. Questions about that idea? Yeah. OK, how do, how do you rotate the, the rocket so it to, to aim in the direction you want. Well, two ways. One is the 
straightforward way, and the other one is a clever way. The, the straightforward way is to actually have other rocket engines on the ship that push, and they can twist, exert torques on it, and make it rotate. So that'll work, and that's part of the story in some cases. The other is to have a spinning wheel on board. And you saw when I was playing games with that spinning wheel sitting on a, on a uh, swivel chair, that if I, if I have the spinning wheel and I play with it, I can make myself begin to rotate as, as the two of us exchange angular momentum. So pivoting, I can, I can make myself rotate and then I can stop. And that's how spe that, that is how particularly satellites orient themselves to aim themselves, is they have spinning wheels on board. Uh, the, the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, has spinning wheels, and some of the issues, w w like, or some of the, some of the satellites, when they finally um, fail, the failure is in their spinning wheels. Uh, they have like four of them to begin with, and then one fails, they got three, and they can still work with two. But, they, but they're playing angular momentum exchanges and causing the whole ship to rotate, and then they stop, they undo the, the exchange and they stop rotating. Is that, is that making sense? Can you figure? visualize this, the spinning wheels allow, it, allow the ship to temporarily rotate to, by, by acquiring some angular momentum from the wheel, rotating, and then giving it back to the wheel. Yeah? I think they spin for the life of the satellite. And it, if, they're, if they're in good bearings, they spin, it, do, it doesn't cost anything. So I think pretty much they spin the whole time. Um, and because the satellites are, all, are, I think they're always uh, adjusting their pointing. I'm not sure that's entirely true, but that's, yeah, I, I would expect them to spin full time, maybe they don't. Other questions? All right. The other question that I wanted to, to pursue, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on this, is, is the idea that, that when you're in a, in a ship, in a spaceship, and you have some balloons around, well, first off, there is air on the ship, which I guess I could have put it explicitly in the question, but you can't blow up a balloon and have it survive in, a, uh, in an empty ship with vacuum in it. We saw what happened when you put a balloon in vacuum. It pops. So, so a spaceship with balloons in it has, also has air in the, in the spaceship. If you have a balloon in a spaceship with a, full, of air, full of air, and there's no gravity and no acceleration, the balloon is not in the same environment a balloon would be in here. Here on Earth, the air has a gradient in its pressure and density. High pressure and density down there, less high pressure and density up here. Why? Because of this need to keep supporting layer after layer after layer of air against the pull of gravity. So gravity creates this density gradient and pressure gradient in the, in the Earth's atmosphere. Get rid of gravity, well, first, here on Earth, the air would leave. We'd have no atmosphere. Um, in a spaceship, you can prevent that by sealing it. So the spaceship is a bottle. If they open the lid on that bottle, the air's going to leave, too. So they don't. They keep it closed. And the air's in there, but there is no pressure and density gradient. There's no reason for one. The air is perfectly happy to be wherever it wants to be. It's got no forces on it. Just, it's all uniform. Uh, if there were a high pressure area and a low pressure area, the air would accelerate from high pressure toward low pressure and fill in the low pressure. So it's all uniform. Okay? The result is that there's no buoyant force. There's no, dent, there's no variation in pressure anywhere. So you put a balloon in the middle of that, it's pushed the same on each side. There's no difference. Here on Earth, the pressure at the bottom of the balloon is higher than the pressure at the top of the balloon. And so the upward push is a little stronger than the downward push. And the balloon experiences this net, this overall buoyant force. There's no buoyant force in a, in a spacecraft that's just coasting. So you can put whatever you like out there. Helium balloon, air balloon, water balloon, lead balloon, trial balloon. They'll all hover. No, no, no tendency to go anywhere. On the other hand, if you hit the accelerator, fire the rocket engines, the ship is accelerating, say, towards your right, in that case, the air in the ship and everything else that's not tied down will tend to drift toward the back, or at least for the first instant, because the ship is, is essentially leave, trying to leave them behind. Well, the air in the ship will pile up at the back of the ship because it's, um, 
if there were an open port there, it would just fly right out the, right out the back. But actually, it, 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 it piles up there because of inertia. And suddenly, you end up with a gradient in pressure and density in the ship. The pressure and density are highest at the back of the ship, where the ship is where it's slamming into the back of the ship. And then the pressure and density get, get less and less as you go forward in the ship to the nose. So there is a pressure gradient from high pressure, high density at the back of the ship where the air is trying to pile up uh, because of inertia to low pressure, low density at the front of the, the nose of the ship. As a result, there's a buoyant force. Anything you, you, you put into, the, into this air, which has a gradient in pressure, will experience a, a push because it's going to be pushed forward a little harder than it's pushed backward by this, this funny distribution of pressure. And depending on the density of the thing you put in there, it'll either be pushed forward harder than, it's, than inertia is pulling it back or less hard. It'll, it'll, uh, a, a lead balloon, in this case, will drift toward the back of the ship because it's got so much inertia, so much mass, that this wimpy little buoyant force pushing it forward will not succeed in making it accelerate as fast as the ship. The ship will overtake it, and the lead balloon will smash into the back of the ship where the rocket engine is. Okay. On the other hand, if it's an air balloon that, that's exactly the same density as air, it will move along with the ship. It, will neither, it won't move toward the front or the back because, like the air around it, it would be perfectly pushed forward by, this, by the buoyant force just so it accelerates perfectly with the ship. And if it's helium, it'll go to the front of the ship because it'll be pushed forward with a strong buoyant force that, that's, that's more than enough to make it accelerate faster than the ship. It will move to the front. All right? That last phenomena is familiar to many of you. It'll be more familiar when you have kids and helium balloons in the car. And when you, you, you stop at the red light, the kids are in the back, and they're ignoring their helium balloons, which are sitting on the ceiling, pressed against the ceiling, and they start squabbling over something. My iPad, right? Um, and then you, you, you hit the accelerator, head forward to the light. All the air in the car begins to pile up at the back of the car because of inertia. It is, it's a real effect. You end up with a buoyant force pushing forward. And the helium balloon, because it's got so little mass, accelerates forward in response to this buoyant force. And it goes forward faster than the car does. It accelerates faster than the car. And it, and it goes right into the front seat of the car and into the windshield. And so pay attention. It's, this happens all the time. The, 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 the helium balloons drift to the front of the car, and the parents are pushing them out of the way. Get the balloons back there. Yeah. Do the helium balloons not have inertia? They do. They've got mass. They've got weight. But it's very little mass. And so a, a very gentle force on a, something with a little mass can cause it to accelerate quite fast. So the forward buoyant force on the various balloons in the car, the air balloon, the helium balloon, on the air balloon, that forward force, that buoyant force, is, is pushing on a big mass of, of air. It doesn't accelerate all that fast. But when it pushes, on, the same force pushes on a helium-filled balloon, with tiny mass, it accelerates fast. The helium balloon accelerates fast, and oh, it, it runs ahead of the car. It picks up speed faster than the car does. Is that, you're looking? Well, it's, the car is, is heading forward, accelerating forward. It's tending to leave everything behind, everything to, for, for the contents of the car to, to move forward, including the people, of course. They need to be pushed. So there are various forces pushing on them. And it finally comes down to what's pushing on the balloons. Well, the only thing that's pushing on the balloons, if they're not at the, at the back window of the car, is the air in the car. And the air, the air itself is is being pushed back. Is is tending to pile up in the back. The air, the, the air in the car has its own inertia, and it tends to pile up in the back of the car. And it's sort of a question of. Who fights to get into the back hardest? A lead balloon will fight quite hard because it's got a huge mass, very dense. An air-filled balloon, not so much because it doesn't have nearly the density. The other air will, will compete effectively with it, and it won't drift toward the back of the car. And the helium balloon, being the lightest little fluffy thing, is like a bubble being pushed forward as the air rushes to the back. The air wins. The air with all its, it, is denser. The air rushes to the back of the car 
really the car overtaking that air, but it piles, the air piles up the back, and it squirts this little bubble of helium forward. Because the helium bubble is, is so easy, you just sort of smack it out of the way and push it forward. OK? All right, so that's, I think, a, any, any questions about balloons in general? The idea of the, the, the buoyant force, the idea that, that if you reduce the, the, the average density inside a balloon one way or the other, you can get it to float in the air and actually accelerate upward. Yeah? The, the, in the car. It, it, in the car, the balloon is, is, the two effects that are going on are the balloon has its, its inertia, it's, therefore it's trying to keep doing what it was doing, which, w in which case the, the car would leave it behind and the balloon would then drift toward the back of the, of the car. And there's only one important force on the balloon, and that is the buoyant force forward exerted by the other air trying to squirt it out of the way. So it's a competition between the mass of the balloon, its inertia, taking it to the back, and the buoyant, th this buoyant force effect trying to take the balloon to the front. And a force on a mass will cause it to accelerate. So everything is being pushed forward by the buoyant force. Everything is accelerating forward, in part because of the buoyant force. The question is, how fast is that acceleration? If it's a helium balloon, that acceleration is very fast because it's a little mass with a big force. If it's a lead balloon, the acceleration is very slow because it's a huge mass and a little force. And an air balloon is just the right balance so it will accelerate with the car and, and not get ahead or behind. Is that okay? Uh, other questions? All right. So, yeah, leave, leave balloons then um, and go on to water distribution. Uh, one of the, so it, it, in part, this is the story of the other kind of fluid. We've looked at gases, and gases, because they're individual particles that are bouncing around with thermal energy and, and kept apart by the thermal energy, they have the characteristic that you can change their density. You can pack a gas tightly and, and, and have a lot of mass in a small volume, like, a, like the air in a scuba tank. There's a lot of molecules in a scuba tank, and it's got a lot of mass per volume. That, that's, that stuff, if you shake it, is tough. Okay? Um, so gases, you can, you can vary the density. And as you do that, you vary the pressure. They go together. They're almost proportional to one another, and, except in circumstances, for example, where the molecules begin to stick together. As happens at low temperature with air, it turns into a liquid, and then the story changes. Liquids have the characteristic that, that OK, they can change shape, but, they, but it's very hard to change the density of a liquid. So water has a density of about uh, one kilogram per liter. And there's not a lot you can do to change that. Temperature uh, affects it a, a little bit. Um, and we'll talk about that when I talk about water. Um, you can make it shrink and, and, and expand a little bit with playing with temperature. But otherwise, pretty much, it's, a, it's a, a kilogram per liter, give or take a tiny bit. You can't do much. You can squeeze really hard on water. You will not pack the molecules much tighter <coughs> together. Because they're already in contact with each other. They hate being pushed tight more tightly together. They fight it just furiously. So liquids pretty much have fixed densities based on their own chemistry. Uh, mercury, for example, is a very dense liquid. Lots of fun to play with. Um, um, alas, it's, it's toxic and stuff enough. We, we have, we, at least we had, we, we had tens of kilograms of the stuff in the, in the department. It was lots of fun to play with, but I, I, I'm hesitant to bring it out anymore. Yeah. That's right. You can change water's pressure very easily. I'll do it for you. I, I, I'm covering the bottle. I'm just squeezing. That's all it took. Pressure surges upward, much higher than before. I can show you by pulling my finger off. Water squirts. That's part of the story coming up. But, but the water didn't get smaller. If this were full of air, you know that you can do that. You can take an air-filled bottle, pinch it off. And you, can, you can squeeze it significantly, not, not hard. You can't do it with water. All right? So my, qu my opening question here. When water enters your, your home, it's typically coming in uh, just below the, sort of the frost line in a, in a pipe. It comes in underground, but not very far underground. It goes in to, through, through plumbing to the upper floors, lower floors. 
if you have a whole, if you have full baths in every floor, where are you going to get the strongest shower, the most intense spray? And the choices are the entry floor, the basement floor, or the, or the floor above the entry floor. Second, second. You okay with the question? How many think you'll get the best spray at the entry floor, the ground floor A? A? How many think you'll get it in the basement shower? How many think that you'll get it in the second floor shower? Okay, it's almost unanimous that it's the, it's the basement floor, and that is correct. And it's an energy issue, as we'll, as we'll see. Water and plumbing, when it's flowing smoothly in plumbing, and we'll, by smoothly I'm, I'm uh, rejecting the possibility that it tumbles, that it has turbulence, which we'll come to later on. If it's flowing smoothly, and to the extent that it doesn't rub on the walls, which is another effect we're sweeping under the rug for right now, the, the, the syrupiness of water and its, its tendency to rub against itself. If we neglect those, then water carries with it energy, and it carries the energy in, in as we'll see, three forms. One of them is gravitational potential energy, one of them is kinetic energy, the energy of motion, and the third is energy associated with pressure. And it can't make energy out of nothing. So if it's got all its energy tied up in one form, it can't have a lot in the other forms. And this is now the story then of gravitational potential energy. The higher you make the water travel, the more of its energy is tied up in the form of gravitational potential energy. And the less is left for the other two forms, pressure and kinetic. And finally, when you spray it out into the open air, uh, you're, you're forcing it to give up any pressure associated energy. Pressure potential energy is what I call it. So the energy then is, is, is in only two, two available forms, gravitational and kinetic. And if, it's, if you're on a high floor, a lot of that energy is gravitational. If you're on a low, and there's not much left for kinetic. And if you're on a low floor, you don't need to tie up so much of the energy in, in gravitational. The kinetic can be big. So the lower the floor, the harder the spray. And lest I forget this stuff in the future, to tell you, it, it, this is stuff I put in the book, what, but, but tall buildings, in, in the era before tall buildings, you know, a couple hundred years ago, these issues didn't matter. Of course, people didn't have much plumbing back then either. But tall buildings are really complicated. Uh, in their water delivery systems. You cannot create a skyscraper in which all the, the bathrooms are connected by a single pipe. It will have all kinds of bad characteristics. It'll have no spray, no, there'll be no pressure, no spray up in the top floors. In the bottom floors, you'll be able to be basically uh, a cut sheet metal with the water coming out of the, 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 the nozzles. It'll, they'll be, it'll be traveling so fast, it'll be crazy. Okay. So they have to have uh, a whole infrastructure inside these tall buildings. You know, next time, you, some of you may be architects, or if you get involved, you got to plan for the water system. It's complicated. It's actually complicated in a hilly city. So in, in, uh, in the Midwest, no problem. But you go into uh, the mountains, <laughs> the water systems are complicated. OK, so some, some observations about water distribution. Uh, water is pressurized in pipes. So this is, you know, how do you get it to go where you want it to go? You, it needs to be pushed. And how do you push on a fluid? Well, with pressure. And it isn't just the total pressure. It's differences in pressure that cause water to accelerate from one place to another, pick up speed going in a different direction. So, so we're going to start in, in this context. We're going to look at how differences in water pressure can move water around. Uh, later on, we'll look at the, the, the fun and games that happen when moving water encounters things. Uh, like airplane wings. I guess you don't fly planes in water, but OK, submarines. Submarines fly through water. And they have wings and everything else. So they, they, they're like water. Uh, they're like planes in water. And they experience interesting changes in pressure uh, that come from movement. OK, but that's in our future. Right now, we're just going to look at how water moves from high pressure to low pressure, uh, accelerates from high pressure to low pressure, flows through pipes. Um, plays with its energy, moves energy from one form to another as it goes through various parts of the plumbing. And uh, things like, at the end, the, the, the fact that water is often stored way up high, it's at great height, in water towers or in the tops of buildings, uh, that's an energy issue. They just need, they're just storing, they're, yeah, they're storing water, the, li the liquid itself, great, but they're also storing energy. 
because energy is a, a very important part of the whole delivery process. So questions, things like how, how does water move through, through level pipes? And that's that's going to be an issue of pressure. How do you make pressure? And uh, we'll go on from there. So first off, how does water move through level pipes? And water, like everything else, it has it has inertia, it tends to keep doing what it's doing. If you want to make it accelerate, you have to push on it. Pushing on it with your finger is kind of tricky because it's, with a force it, it is tough because it sort of squirts around your finger. So instead, you push on it with pressures and differences in pressure. So, oh, do I? Yeah. So there I've got water in a little teeny pipe. And it's right now, it's inertial and at rest. And it has inertia. It will tend to stay at rest until I push on it and cause it to accelerate. And the way to push on it to cause it to accelerate is to expose it to a difference in pressure. I'll leave atmospheric pressure on this side, and I'll go to higher than atmospheric pressure on that side. Out it goes. <laughs> it's all in the name of physics. You know. Purposes of physics is justifiable. So I, I created a pressure imbalance across the, this horizontal pipe. You know, to make life easy to start with, we'll assume everything's horizontal. It gets gravity out of the story. Gravity doesn't care about things that are horizontal plumbing. It doesn't push anything along the pipes. It might push them against the walls, but the walls then take care of that. So if I have a horizontal pipe with atmospheric pressure and atmospheric pressure on both sides, there's no overall push on the water. The water just sits there doing what it was doing. In principle, if it was moving, it would keep moving, but I don't have a long pipe to show you. If it, but it would start with, at rest. I pushed on it by exposing it to high pressure on one side, low pressure on the other, or lower pressure on the other, and off it went. OK? Uh, so, so apart from blowing on it with your mouth, how can you produce pressurized water? And the answer, I can go back to this, this story, you just trap the water in a container and squeeze. So if I, I, I'll cover the, the, the tip to trap it. When I squeeze inward on it, I'm pushing inward with lots of forces on various parts. Uh, when it reaches equilibrium, it's evidently pushing outward. The water is pushing outward on the bottle as hard as I'm pushing inward on the bottle so that the net force, so the net forces on each part of the bottle is zero. It's at equilibrium. Right? I'm pushing in hard, but nothing's happening. No accelerations. How is that possible? Wa the water's canceling my push by pushing outward hard. So I've created pressure in the water. Is that OK with everybody? If you were in there and you're, if you were swimming in here, your ears would pop. You'd feel, oh man, the pressure just went way up. It really is high. And if I now give the water a place to go, that is a, a place where the pressure is lower, it will accelerate towards lower pressure. And there it goes. It went from high pressure in here to low pressure out there. It accelerates toward lower pressure. It's, it's just, if, if you imagine that a, a blob of water with no container around it, just a little blob sitting in, near the nozzle of that squirter, technical word, squirter, um, there's high pressure on this side where, I've, where I'm squeezing the bottle. And atmospheric pressure on that side, where I'm not squeezing, you know, it's outside, this blob of water experiences a, an overall push, a, a net force that way toward lower pressure. So the water, water just as a general rule of thumb, setting aside gravity, which complicates the story, water or any fluid accelerates toward lower pressure. Because the pressures don't match. When there's, a, when there's a gradient pressure, the pressures don't match. The forces, there's a net force on each blob, and then that force pushes toward lower pressure. All right, so uh, the last line, two lines in here, is, is my, that observation about water uh, having a fixed density. You can't really change its, its volume by squeezing it. The, the name for a of a substance that's, that, that doesn't change volume when you squeeze it, it's called incompressible. And liquids, by and large, are incompressible. So are most solids. It's just a, it's a useful term. Gases are compressible. Liquids are not. If you try to run a liquid through a compressor, 
like the compressor in your refrigerator, air conditioner. Those are the main ones you encounter. Uh, the liquid will not compress, and it may break the compressor, which is trying to squeeze it in, 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 to a smaller volume. And this is one of the reasons why, for example, they tell you don't cycle your, your uh, air conditioner on and off too rapidly. Like After you turn it off, leave it off for a while, don't immediately turn it back on. Because at least in old uh, air conditioners, they may be protected against this now, it was possible to have the compressor, instead of operating with a gas, accidentally operate with a liquid in its squeezing chamber. And it tries to squeeze a liquid, and the liquid will not get smaller. And it will break the compressor. All right. So uh, the water bottle idea of creating pressure, pressurized water uh, is, is fine for a single, single serving. But if you want to deliver water steadily uh, under pressure, you need, you need some sort of pump. And there are lots of kinds of pumps in the world. Um, the pump, the simplest conceptually, simplest kind of pump I could think of is a piston and a cylinder. It's just, it's just a, a cup, basically, with a sealed uh, end cap that goes in and out of that cup. And when it goes out of the cup, water is drawn into the cylinder through a one-way valve. And there are such things as one-way valves, valves that only allow water to flow one, one, in one direction through a plumbing. Uh, so when you pull the piston out of the cup, out of the cylinder, water flows into the cylinder. And then when you push the piston back into the cylinder, it squirts the water under pressure now out a second one-way valve and into the plumbing. So that's just, I guess you'd call it a reciprocating pump. And, and that kind of pump is, is what you have seen, well, if you go on to like a farm or something and they got the, the, the pump, the pump the water pump where you're lifting the handle up and down, is this familiar to anybody anymore? That's what you're doing. You're pushing the piston in and out of a cylinder through the one-way valves and pressurizing water, which ultimately comes up through a pipe and shows up in your cup. Okay. Um, what else about this? Ah, OK. The, the fact that you are pushing a piston into the cylinder to pressurize the water and then squirting this pressurized water out into the plumbing involves work. If you think about it, you're pushing on the piston. In, 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 the, in the system with the farm operation, you're not holding the piston in your own hand, but some mechanical linkage is connecting the movement of your handle up and down with the water being Pressurized and delivered. You know, a volume squirts out of the pump and it goes off and does something interesting. So you're doing work. And so here's the story with doing work. Is when you push that cylinder, that piston, into the cylinder, you're exerting a certain force on it and it's moving a certain distance. You're doing a certain amount of work. Force times distance. And that's, that's this. This is you pushing somehow directly or indirectly on that piston, force times distance, that's the work you do. Well, when it gets down to how hard the piston is pushing on the water and doing work on the water, that force that's involved is actually the surface area of the piston times the pressure of the water, because that's how hard they're put the piston and water are pushing on each other. It's, it's the pressure in the water times the surface area. That's how pressure works. It pushes on surfaces. So the work you're doing is the water pressure times the area of the piston times how far you push the piston. Wait, can you follow that? I mean, it's, you might have to stare at it a couple times to, to sort of get sense. The point is that how hard you push is related to pressure and how big the surface you're pushing on. And then you're moving a certain distance. OK, well, if we regroup here and look at the work you do is, is the pressure in the water times the area of the piston times how far you move that piston. That's the amount of water. you that, that product, the area of the piston times the distance the piston moves, that is the volume of water you're squirting out of the pump's cylinder. That's how much water you're delivering in a stroke of this pump. So that's volume here. 
The point of this, if you follow it or not, is when you pressurize and deliver water with a pump, pressurizing it is the act of squeezing it. Delivering it is the act of, of, of allowing it to flow out of the squeezed environment into the plumbing. The work that you do to do this is the pressure you in the water times the volume you deliver. So just to sort of think about that, that means that the higher the water pressure you're trying to pump, so when you're going kiddie kiddie with the pump, you're probably delivering relatively low pressure water. If somebody pinches things off, and makes you for, re requires you to, to make higher pressure water to, for the delivery, you're going to have to push harder. It's going to get harder to run that pump. <clears throat> Much, you know, that's part of it. There is is if you want to deliver one cup full, it's one amount of work. You want to deliver a hundred cups fulls, it's a hundred parts of work. So. So the amount of work you do is proportional to both how much water you deliver and how high pressure that water is delivered at. And this is not a, these are not insignificant numbers. Uh, typical water delivery pressure in a house, in the US, US units, it would be of, I don't know, uh, 80, 80 pounds per square inch, something like, which is, which is about uh, five atmospheres, five times as strong as the atmospheric pressure. Um, and the volume, well, you deliver gallons, and you, you want to fill a, a, a pool, it's a lot of gallons. The, the energy involved in that delivery, that kind of pressure and that kind of volume of water is huge. It's, it's, you couldn't do it yourself in a day. This is, this is um, I, I guess I should calculate out these numbers. And tell you, they're, they're, they're a lot of calories. You want, you want to, you want to Burn off a lot of calories, run a water pump yourself for a while. Deliver water to your neighborhood. You'll, you'll, you'll get exhausted. Um, as a sort of example of this, sort, this issue, you know, how much energy there is in pressurized water, most toilets store the water just in a tank, a, few, you know, a foot or two above the, 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 where, where the, biz, the business end of the toilet. There are, however, some toilets that store the water in pressure, under pressure. They, they use the delivery pressure to, to pack the water into a tank. With, actually, it's got compressed air in there, storing the energy. And when you flush them, they're completely different. In the one where the water just sort of dribbles down and, and, and it goes, it's, it's a gentle flush. And the other one is, right? It's, your, it's the home version of, these, uh, of, of the institutional toilets. The point is, there's a lot of energy delivered along with 1.6 gallons of water, whatever the standard uh, low-flow low toilet uses now, there's a lot of energy delivered there, too. In a normal toilet, that energy is wasted. It's turned into thermal energy. In one of these toilets that stores the energy, they're storing a lot of energy. And it does, it does things you could not do otherwise. OK? It's not a pitch for one toilet versus the other. It's just an observation. All right. So. Where does the work that you do go? And then I, I yeah. the the energy goes through the goes through the plumbing, and it takes one of three forms or some mixture thereof. It can become kinetic energy if the water is moving fast or you know moving at all. It can become gravitational potential energy if the water goes up, and it can become pressure potential energy. It, when the water is under pressure, pressurized water carries, effectively carries energy with it because it took work to make pressurized water and deliver it, and you can get that work out at the far end. The peculiar thing about the energy associated with pressure is that it's a promise rather than a con it's It's not in the water itself. It's in the promise to replace the water if you use it. So if you open a faucet that's under pressure, with, with water under pressure, the water comes roaring out, can do nice things, wash your dishes, whatever. Uh, the energy that was in the water prior to coming out the faucet was largely in the form of this pressure potential energy. But it was really not in the water so much as the, in, the, in the water company's willingness to replace the water once you use it. The details of that not so important. We'll, we'll see cases where, where it matters and doesn't. But the mo main thing I want you to, 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 to take away, and I, then I want to play games here, because otherwise the day will go by. Um, 
is the water can carry energy in three forms, gravitational potential, kinetic, and pressure potential energy. And I'm going to actually jump my notes to the full version of this. Come back here. What are you doing there? There's an equation known as Bernoulli's equation. And what it says, this, this is the equation. It says that when, when water is flowing through plumbing, and things like water are flowing through things like plumbing, the energy per, per unit of volume, so, so to sort of, instead of worrying about the whole plumbing, look at, look at every liter of water, or I often talk about it, it's every drop of water. Every drop of water moving along this plumbing, if you follow the, that drop as it moves, and I'll talk more about that movement, uh, the energy, the order of energy, that's, that is not the thermal energy, leave the thermal energy out, but the energy that's useful, it can do work, in each drop is the sum of three parts. The energy that's in the pressure, pressure potential energy, PPE. The energy that's in, in motion, kinetic energy, KE. And the energy that's in gravitational form, gravitational potential energy, GPE. The sum of those three kinds of energy per drop is constant. And it's constant for, a dr for drops that share the same history. You've got to watch them flow through the plumbing. Don't compare drops that don't have the same history, that don't follow the same path, what is called a streamline. The drops along a specific streamline can, can convert energy from one form to the other. And, but the sum is constant. All right? I'll show you. I, I did this last time. I'll show it to you again. Here's an example of plumbing. And we'll get it started. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the energy into the plumbing by lifting the tank of water, which, uh, an activity which requires work. It's equivalent to pumping it. I pushed it up. It moved up. I did work on it. So it now has energy here. And the energy in each drop is in the form of gravitational potential energy. It's got a certain gravitational potential energy per drop. As that water descends down this pipe, as each drop goes down, its gravitational potential energy decreases because it's lower. Where does that energy go? It becomes pressure potential energy. And the pres pressure potential energy becomes greatest at the bottom, the lowest point. It then comes back up and converts some of its gravitational potential energy, its pressure potential energy, back into gravitational. And then it goes through a nozzle. And a nozzle has the, the nice uh, behavior of forcing the water to convert its pressure potential energy, and going from high pressure before the nozzle to atmospheric after turns its pressure potential energy into kinetic. And there it goes. Oops. Let's go up. So the energy is going from gravitational to pressure to a little bit more gravitational to kinetic, back to gravitational, back to kinetic. And when it hits, it actually the pressure rises. So there's actually high pressure there, too. Uh, that, we'll get back to that eventually. Okay. And I told you last time, the energy is conserved, so it's only got so much energy per drop in the tank, it can only go back to a certain height. It can't go back up higher than it started. It doesn't have the energy. If we start with water with more energy per drop, it comes down lots of pressure potential energy, and right, it goes back almost to where it started. Can I break the bulbs? No. OK? It's always fun. <laughs> All right. Um, before I play, play vacuum cannon games, he, here's, here's another peculiar one. This is really this is useful. I, I don't know if you've ever encountered a siphon. I'm going to fill this plumbing with water. I've got to get the air out, which is not trivial. OK. And now, the water is draining out of the tank through this hose. Uh, this is how you empty a tank that you can't, rather than bailing it out with a cup, 
which, which would take you all day, run a, run a pipe. And what the water is doing, you, you, I, I'm going to show you the water keeps flowing here. What's happening is the water here has a certain amount of gravitational potential energy. Its pressure is atmospheric right here at the top because it's in contact with the Earth's with atmosphere. So that's atmospheric there. And as it goes up here, which it is doing, it's actually rising up in this pipe. <gasps> it's turning what into what? It's turning pressure potential energy into gravitational potential energy. There's a little kinetic around, too. But the pressure here is actually below atmospheric pressure. The, the pressure here, it's not zero. It's atmospheric pressure. It is possible, in certain contexts, to convert atmospheric pressure, pressure potential energy, into other forms if you allow it to go below atmospheric pressure. So the pressure actually he here is less than atmospheric. The water is going up into a, into a low pressure. And then as it descends, it goes back towards atmospheric. It's atmospheric because it flows out that pipe. But it has used the fact that it still has some energy left at atmospheric pressure to lift it up over uh, an intermediate barrier and then have it descend. So can you questions about that? I mean, it's not easy to follow how a siphon works. The fact that the pressure actually goes below atmospheric and then back up to atmospheric is a little bizarre. But it allows you to drain the water out of a tank without tipping the tank over or bailing it. The, the, the requirement, however, is that the, the uh, exit has to be below the entrance. So the energy, there, there's a net transfer of energy from gravitational to, uh, to kinetic. If I lift the, the exit too high, the siphon stops and actually runs backwards, and then it's dead. Air, air gets in, and it's over. All right? So if, if you remember nothing from this class, remember how to use a siphon. It's useful. All right, last demonstration, because you have to do this one, OK? Um, and I need somebody to help me with this. This is a vacuum cannon. And, and I told you about this er, you know, a month ago or something like that. We're going to take all the air out of this cannon, out of, out of this chamber. It's going to be plugged to both ends. Then we're going to knock the plug off one end. Air will rush into it. Air goes from high pressure, being atmospheric, to low pressure. It accelerates, and it whisks the ball with it, which will come out at about 150 miles an hour. Will someone help me do this? Everyone's in a Please. So here it's all plugged up. If you'll hold this against that okay. to seal it, I will seal the other end, OK? And the pressure should start going down. It is. Oops. It's, I, I got to let the pressure get low enough to hold this in place. OK, that's good. Keep, 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 you, you can let go of that. It's, it's, it will be held in by atmospheric pressure. You're, you're OK. It's held. OK, so, so we're taking the air out with a pump. It's coming out this, this, this section here. When the air pressure gets pretty close to, to inside there, gets pretty close to true zero, like no pressure, we'll seal this off. And mind your name? Marie. Mar Mar Marie. We'll, we'll knock this plug off with a mallet. Air will rush in there and convert its pressure potential energy into kinetic energy. Which, which it'll go fast. That's a lot of kinetic energy. It will whisk the ball out, and this plug will, f will be pulled away by a bungee cord as the pressure disappears, and the ball will come out really fast. But you can't blink, because you only get it goes really fast. I think we're good. OK. So your job okay. is to whack that post oh. with a mallet and release the vacuum, OK? Well, if you, you, you can give a try. Oh, <laughs> it, yeah, it's. It <laughs> <laughs> well done. Thank you. For those of you who didn't see it, the ball's over here somewhere. <laughs> yeah.